The next thing I want to say about the resurrection is it's the consummation of our union with Jesus. 1 Thessalonians 4, 17 says this. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them, the dead who have been raised, in clouds to meet the Lord in the air. That's very interesting because there are two Greek words for air. One describes the higher rarefied air, the other the air nearer the earth's surface. The word that's used here is the lower air. So we won't go very far above the earth to meet the Lord. All right. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. After that, no more partings. We shall always be with the Lord and we shall always be with one another. Now, I have a wife whom I love dearly who's gone ahead of me. But one day, We'll be together forever. Dear, dear brothers and sisters, don't miss this. It's the greatest tragedy of your life if you miss this. It's earnest. It's serious. Finally, and I have to say this rapidly, the resurrection will be in three phases. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 22. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one of us in his own order, and here's the order, three separate phases. First, Christ the first fruits, then those who are Christ at his coming, and finally the end, the final resurrection of all the remaining dead. Whom is Jesus coming back? Those that are Christ's. He's not coming back. He's not a thief. He's not going to take anything or anybody that doesn't belong to him. Do you really belong to him? Important question. Those are the ones he's coming back for. He's called the first fruits. And here's one final passage from the Bible that is really exciting. Leviticus chapter 9, I think it is. Just one quick brief ceremony. Where did I write that down in my outline? Leviticus 23, sorry. Bear with me. This is a ceremony under the law of Moses. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land which I give to you and reap its harvest, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. He shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted on your behalf. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave, wave it. What day is the Sabbath? What day of the week? Saturday. What's the day after the Sabbath? Sunday. What day did Jesus rise? Sunday. That's right. He was the sheaf. And he was waved on our behalf that we might be accepted because of him. But he wasn't just one stalk. He was a sheaf. And if you read in Matthew chapter 27, when Jesus died, there was an earthquake, the tombs were opened, and many of the righteous dead came out into the city. I don't believe they went back into the tombs. I believe they went up with Jesus. They became the sheaf that was waved before the Lord, saying, there's a great multitude to follow. But here we are. We're the sheaf, we're the first fruits. Now, I really can't go any further. I am absolutely depressed in my spirit to challenge you as to whether you really are pressing toward the mark, whether you have got the right priorities in your life. In 1977, I think, I was at some meeting in the North Island somewhere here on intercession. And I was teaching about the fact that there's a strong man over every nation. And they said to us, said to me, what's the strong man over New Zealand? 
So I said, it's not my job to tell you. You're the New Zealand Christians. You have to find out. But at that moment, I felt the Lord said, I'll tell you the strong man. So I came back and I told them. But at that time, Bill Sobritsky, who's a close friend of ours, was sitting way back with one of his daughters. And he told me afterwards, at the moment that I said this, God said the same to him. And what I said was this, and it'll surprise you. It's a kind of anticlimax. The strong man over New Zealand is indifference. Now, I can't talk like a Kiwi, but Kiwis have said to me, the typical statement of a New Zealander is, she'll be right, Jack. In other words, it'll take care of itself. If we leave it, it'll get all right. That is your number one problem in New Zealand. And it's the problem of some of you. And if you don't deal with that problem, you won't be ready. Because Jesus is not coming back for the indifferent. He's coming back for those who are eagerly waiting for him. Now, I want to give you an opportunity. I wouldn't be fair to you if I didn't. If you really are aware, in the light of what I've been saying, that you are not living the way you should be living to wait for Jesus, it's time for you to change. You remember what I said about repentance? It's a decision followed by an action. If you need to repent, and I'm talking to each one of you individually, I don't know most of you personally, but if you need to repent, this is the time to do it. You remember what I said? You can't repent just when you want to. You can only repent when the Holy Spirit prompts you. So now, if there are those here this morning, you know the Holy Spirit is telling you you're not living right. You're not in the attitude that you should be if you're expecting my return. But you want to put it right. I want to challenge you. I want to give you an opportunity. I want to invite you to get out of your seat and come down here to the front and pray. Now, that, to do that, you'll have to humble yourself. If you don't do it, it's not my responsibility. But if you know that you're not ready to meet the Lord, you're not living in a way that indicates you're eagerly awaiting his return, and you want to put things right with God, now and here is the best time to do it. So I'm going to give you an opportunity. I'm not going to prolong this appeal, but if you want to get right with God, here today, I'm inviting you to come forward and kneel.